This is Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you are welcome. (laughs) (laughs) You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback, and we want to hear from you. This week, Walk-In's Welcome is happy to partner with Folane. Folane is a clean beauty retailer with a curated selection of the highest performing, safest, and 100% non-toxic products. There's a special offer for listeners of Walk-In's Welcome for only $22. That's over 50% off. Try the Clean Essentials Kit today. Go to folane.com slash walk-in to try the kit and enter walk-in at checkout for free shipping. That's spelled F-O-L-L-A-I-N dot com slash walk-in and use promo code walk-in, W-A-L-K-I-N, at checkout to get your clean essentials kit for only $22 with free shipping. This week, we're deviating from the normal walk-ins welcome format because a lot of people have been asking me who I am and what I do and how I got here and what is fetacy and a lot of questions. So I thought I'd start this new segment that we'll do occasionally called Story Hour with Bridget Fetacy. Some names have been bleeped to protect the innocent. A lot of people have questions about yours truly and my story and journey and Maggie, my producing partner and cousin on this podcast and also in life on scripts and all kinds of other creative endeavors, greeting cards, make Brad Pitt great again hats, whatever it is, Fetacy Incorporated, Maggie probably has a behind the scenes hand in it. And so she's going to interview me and we're going to tell stories about how we ended up here in LA doing this. Because a large part of what inspired this podcast is just the sheer grit and determination that it's taken me to even get to the point where I'm doing this podcast. I think one of the things a lot of people want to know is what is fetacy? Yes, fair question. And where the idea came from. Fetacy is not my last name. It is now, but it's, it's a stage name. But it started as a word I made up for a company, as we do when we make up words for companies. <laughs> <laughs> Google wasn't a word either, guys. People are like, you can't do that. You can't just make up a word for a company. Google was a word. What? It, it's a number. It's like some sort of mathematical term, I think. Really? Yeah. Pretty sure. Well, no one knows that. <laughs> Except for you. <laughs> And probably lots of other people, but I didn't know that. (laughs) But fetacy, yes, it's a word you made up. And tell us what the definition is, Bridget. Well, it's taken only 15 15 short years to nail it down. It's basically a moment. It's when parody becomes reality, the best way to describe it. So we are living in the age of fetacy at this moment, which is why it's suddenly become so easy to define All of these things always happened to me in life that were beyond parody. They were, it was like, I used to describe it as when irony doubles back on itself and becomes literal, which is basically parody becoming reality and or irony squared, which is a little too heady for the average person to get their mind around, including me. It was always (laughs) very hard to describe, but you knew those moments when you had them. You you would also describe them as God's laughing at me moments. Yeah. Like it was a moment you look up at the sky and you're like, oh, come on, really? (laughs) This can't be real. This can't be. And that can be good and bad. There there are moments in my life that, that have been tragic or tragic things have happened to people that I know where it's not ironic. It's, it's a fetacy, but like a, the dark side of a fetacy, Mm -hmm. like, like my friend who specifically stayed overnight to avoid drunk drivers and was on her way to a class to help people with addiction and got hit by a guy who had been up all night doing blow and killed her Mm -hmm. and not to like start this off on a horrible note but that is just an example of like come on that right it's just too it's like the guy who freaking started segway segwaying off a cliff (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> yes, that's a fantasy. <laughs> I should write a song. It's like the guy on a Segway <laughs> running off a cliff. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's what that is. Fantasy was devised as a name for a company because my sister and I, we come from divorce. My family's uh, like many, many Americans and people all over the world. Our parents were divorced and we were always looking for greeting cards and none of them ever spoke to us because they were all for they were Hallmark cards. They're they're better about it now. I feel like now it's better. I still think the market is there for our greeting yes. cards. We have lists of greeting cards that we want to make in notebooks. And uh, and many designed already. Uh-huh. So if you want to fund our greeting card line and you're listening to this and you're a billionaire and you're like, you know, this girl's on to something. I like these two. They've got moxie. Then welcome, friend. Please email me <laughs> because I have this stuff all ready to go. I just need someone with a little bit of business acumen. <laughs> a little bit of startup capital. <laughs> I need an angel investor stat for this. Anyway. The angel investor was me, because I'm an idiot, and I started Fetacy.com, and I made a bunch of these greeting cards, and they were digital greeting cards. This was back in 2005, mm -hmm. and- They were limited edition printings. And, and then, then digital e-cards that you could send, and they were sweet. They like flip, they were, they, they were, um- what were they called? The, the Flash. Flash, which is horrible. But they were awesome because they actually flipped and made a noise. They were really cool, but, you know, no one who uses Flash. Does anyone use yeah, Flash anymore? I, so. I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> we're old ladies. We're, <laughs> we're 80. Like the internets. <laughs> Maggie's barely on the internets. <laughs> and I'm on Twitter, but that's as far in the internets as I go. But I'm still like an 80-year-old with technology. And so started fantasy and it then <laughs> i decided in all of my genius to take fantasy on a tour uh, well there was also t-shirts there were t-shirts as well there will always be there are, were awesome t-shirts also an angel investor listening we have millions of those ready ready to go ideas waiting to pull the trigger on <laughs> <laughs> someone build us a website <laughs> <laughs> because your website moved to France. <laughs> oh, God, it's so heartbreaking. That's a long story. Okay, that's the story we're getting to. We'll end up with how Fetacy.com, the original site, ended up disbanding and moving to France. That's where we're, we're headed. So keep us on track, Maggie. I will try. And I was in Rhode Island, and I launched, I put all the money into this. Went into debt. Went into debt. With no, no plan. No business plan. Listen, young grasshoppers out there and Bridget right now doing this again because I'm an idiot. Don't go into business without a business plan. Yep. And so I did that. I was like 26 years old <laughs> or 20. Yeah. Fresh, and fresh out of a marriage. Fresh out of a marriage. Uh -huh. Yep. Yep. Really fresh out of a marriage. And then I launched this website and I was like, well, and it was the dawn of social media too. So hence how I became Bridget Fetacy was everyone was like, you got to get on Face MySpace. You got to get on Facebook. Blah, blah, blah. And I couldn't get on Facebook because I didn't go to college. And so I didn't have a college address. And I did get on MySpace. And I just figured since Fetacy was a word I made up and nobody knew it. And if I was only going on social media for to brand my company that I would just put. And by the way, this is before they had pages for brands. So I couldn't just start a page for everyone's so used to all this stuff now, but right. we didn't have these things. And so I just started my personal profile as Bridget Fetacy, which kind of functioned as the business profile. Also, it was just a way for me to get the brand out. Right. And then I went on tour I was like, just because I'm not a band, it doesn't, I'm a, I was a one woman brand and I took my company, I, I was very restless and I'm like, well, I'm not going to wait for the world to come to me <laughs> online. I'm going to go out and find the world. It was a uh, disaster. <laughs> no, 
Well, uh, you went on tour for six months. Uh, you drove all over the country. Jesus, those stories. In my little Passat with my cousin. A, a different cousin than not, me. Not <laughs> I didn't go because I was finishing college. <laughs> yeah, winners. I was like way behind. <laughs> So I had to finish school. I had to finish school. I was like, you're going to finish school. Mm-hmm. And then my other cousin dropped out of school to come drive around the country with me. Yeah, his, Much to the dismay of my aunt and uncle. His parents were not pleased. No, no, they weren't. And we started in Rhode Island and went down. I was determined to sell T-shirts <laughs> in Miami during spring, spring break. break because a lot of you youngsters <laughs> won't remember Girls Gone Wild. <laughs> but I made about, you know, hundreds of hundreds of T-shirts that said Daddy Would Be Proud in the Girls Gone Wild font. And I thought they'd be selling like hotcakes down there. Yep. Turns and out people weren't so amused. We made decals for the Fetacy car. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> It was branded. I still worry that like some inmate <laughs> found one of those decals when it fell off my car. Talk about like a fantasy story. And when he was cleaning the side of the road and started stalking me online and just biding his time waiting <laughs> to get out of jail in like <laughs> the middle of America. Like, I'll find you, Bridget Fetacy, when I get out of here. Yeah, we had the Fetacy mobile. You went to Florida and then you I went- did sell t shirts. On the beach. Walking up and down the beach, by the way. Mm-hmm. And that's really hard work. And it's why I always buy stuff from people because, my God, I would do it for hour, like hours, like eight hours and make no money. And I, you know, started to we were partying. I was drinking at the time and doing everything else. And we were in Miami. Yep. And I was still quite a youngster. Yep. Yep. Fresh out of Fresh the Girls out. Gone Wild days yourself. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I feel like I was entering the Girls Gone Wild days part two. I was entering my <laughs> Round my <two>. rena- <laughs> renaissance <laughs> phase of Girls Gone Wild. It was like young woman going wild. Mm-hmm. And we had friends in Miami and there was a lot of raging. And my other friend from high school came down and they were all supposed to be helping and Nobody was. They were all partying to like Fort Lauderdale to party. So mad, and I was like, just angrily selling T-shirts and then passive aggressively being pissed off at everybody every night. I remember you calling me about that. Uh, Yeah, they were all just raging, and I was like, trying to make some money. We're supposed to be here to work. (laughs) You guys all promised me you'd come here to help me work, and they were all just there partying. Should have been a preview of all of the coming attractions of the six months, but lo and behold, that my dumbass continued on. Well, and then, okay, so you left Florida and then you guys just like roamed around the country. Yeah, then we went to, you went to different festivals. Well, we went to Oklahoma to the farm. That's right. And then we went to California and went to, that's when we volunteered at Coachella. That was right. my first Coachella ever, 2006. Mm hmm. And we had to guard these like art porto potties. It was nuts. We were, it was nuts. I mean, sleeping on the grounds and they stunk and it was crazy. It was Coachella when Coachella was amazing actually. And it was really fun. And then we went to, we were in Palm Springs for a while and then we went up to, oh God. Then we went to Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz for Easter. And I threw this party. (laughs) on Easter yes. where I got a case Maggie's cringing right now you threw a what's the name of the party Bridget a resurrection party <laughs> <laughs> it's the resurrection that's what we just kept saying and I got a case of champagne and I think a case of vodka it was bananas and everyone dressed up as biblical, biblical characters. characters and my cousin was Jesus and I believe I was Mary Magdalene and we all got blackout drunk, my cousin Jesus in particular, and scared all of the locals in Santa Cruz when we wandered around for our evening stroll, wasted, dressed up like biblical characters while families were out after church. I don't know what we were thinking. And then we had a bonfire and was either jokingly or actually possessed. Oh, God. Cousin. And um, 
he was like pretending to speak in tongues and have like a meltdown and scared all of our cousins. We have, we have 26 cousins. Yes. Uh, so Maggie we- and I, my, our parents are two of 10. Mm-hmm. And so we have cousins everywhere. So the, the, there's a cousin, like they're all over the country. So you guys were visiting cousins in Santa Cruz. Yes. yes. And we l- had to leave the next morning. <laughs> Just like creep out like in the early morning. (laughs) And then we headed off to Seattle and we were trying to get into Vancouver and couldn't because they thought we had all the we couldn't get in with the T-shirts, but they searched my whole car because they thought we had the T-shirts bundled in white garbage bags, (laughs) but they looked like bricks of cocaine. (laughs) And they tore my car apart. They're like, there must be drugs in this car. Sheer idiocy. <laughs> we but we bundled them and then we had them <laughs> taped with taped with duct, duct tape. tape. So they totally looked like drugs. And you guys were just like, yeah, sure, we'll cross a border like this. No problem. <laughs> and they tore the car apart. I mean, it took every they were looking everywhere. They're like, there have to be. Then they were just mad there wasn't anything in there. And they made us leave the T-shirts in America for us to even get into Vancouver because they're like, well, you can't sell things in Vancouver, blah, blah, blah. And then we went to Vancouver, came back, and then we went to a festival in... Oregon? No, it was, in, it was at the Gorge in Washington State. Okay. And I got kicked out of that festival because I was selling T-shirts in the campgrounds and it was causing such a ruckus People were really into me in these t-shirts and they were cheering my name when the co- like rent-a-cops took me away. They were like, fantasy, fantasy, set fantasy free. <laughs> and we got booted and I was so upset because I really wanted to see, um, yeah, we had to get, they took our tickets away. Queens of the Stone Age was headlining. Mm-hmm. And that was the only reason I wanted to be there other than selling t-shirts. And I was killing it selling the t-shirts. Hence why I got in so much trouble. So after all these months of kind of not making that much money, I was finally really cashing in on my T-shirts. And then they made me give, they took my merch, they took some of my T-shirts, the ones I had, and then they booted me out of the festival. (laughs) And so then we left there pretty dismayed, but then we headed down to Utah and hung out in Utah with our friend there, and that was bananas. Because he's a banana's friend. Uh-huh. Um, and then we went to Bonnaroo and Radiohead was headlining and back. It was a great year. And that was nuts. I sold some t-shirts there too. But I mean, mostly at that point, we were like ready to murder each other. Uh-huh. And at this point, nothing had really been getting done. I was running out of money. I was maxing out all my credit cards. Oh, mind you. This was the height of gas prices in America, like to this day. Uh-huh. I still don't think they've ever been as high as they were those specific exact months that I was driving around America. It was nuts. I was just pissing money away. Not to mention all the money we were pissing away drinking right. when I look back on it. Right. And then ended up back on the farm to recoup and I went to Chicago we went to Chicago for the and then my That's cousin right. left That's right and then my best friend lived in Chicago and she drove the final rest of the way back to Rhode <laughs> Island with me and you guys showed up on my doorstep as a surprise oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> we didn't tell anyone you just were like come outside <laughs> we drove straight through we didn't even stop. You you drove straight through. Straight through from Chicago. You at the wheel. That's not and surprising. I was like, she wouldn't let me drive. <laughs> I did that to your sister too. I drove all the way to Iowa before your sister made me pull over and was like, please let me drive, yeah, you psychopath. Because you just spent six months on the road just <laughs> driving insanely. So you were used to it. Yeah, it was. it's nothing. I still do it. I, I'm i pretty convinced there was a trucker in a past life or two because I love those 12-hour drives. Uh-huh. I love them. And America's got great roads for the most part. So then 
fetacy kind of fell apart after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the 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 company side of it for it existed then for years as you you wrote on well, the website. Well, no, remember then I got on Miami Inc. Oh, right. Because when I was in Miami, I stupidly was like, yeah, I'll be on Miami Inc. And I think I signed up or sent in a form and forgot about it. And then they called me and they were like, hey, you made it to like be on my we want you to be on Miami Inc. Can the you come down episode. here? Oh, my God. So then I went down to Miami to go and I was going to get my logo the tattooed logo. on my butt. Yeah, I was going to it was going to be a joke. I was going to brand myself. Uh-huh. Get it? This was pre Kardashians, everyone. <laughs> I know it's not original anymore, but it was at the time. And God has always looked out for me. Yep. Because you got down there. I got down there and it was their first day back from hiatus. They'd been the show at Miami Inc. had been on hiatus. And the guy who was supposed to do my tattoo was so crabby and a psychopath. And I forget which I can't even remember his name right now. I wrote a whole story about it. We'll put it up on Patreon and you'll have to sign up for my Patreon to read it. (laughs) But you'll know how it ends anyway. Right. Because the story went on Fetacy on the website. Yeah. All these stories went on Fetacy, by the way. Yep. The ones that were tellable. Many of them were not. (laughs) Were not. But so you what? finish the story. So I get down there and he's like, I'm not doing this design. Mind you, it's a design he approved. They have to approve the fetishy design. Well, he was trying to do it, but couldn't because the logo, if you've ever seen it, consists of several perfect circles. Like in Yeah, but he approved the design. Right, but then he was trying to sketch it and couldn't do it because it, there's so many perfect circles. <laughs> Don't you think he would have freaking figured that out One before would I think. flew yeah. down to Miami? Yeah. It's not like they flew me. I, I luckily had friends from when I had just been in Miami six months earlier. And I thought it would be good for marketing. So I was like, oh, write this trip off because I'm an idiot. And then I get down there and they're like, we can't do this. And then he was like super crabby and and kind of an asshole. Mm-hmm. And I was like, I don't want that guy touching me with a needle. No way uh-huh. that I don't want that energy near me. I don't want him touching me. Luckily, I'd been doing tons of yoga. So I was all into like the whole the energy. No, I don't want that in me. The producer came out and apologized and he's like, don't you want like a butterfly on your ankle or something? I'm like, no, this is not the whole point is for me to get free marketing. I've never, <laughs> you were like, I've never had a tattoo. I've waited this long to get a tattoo. I want it to be my company logo. Yeah. Thank God. Yeah. Thank God. Thank it didn't work out God. That way. And this was after. So you I had- walked. I was like, I'm going to go for a walk and think about it. And then I came back and I was like, no. Mm-hmm. They were saying they'd do anything else, and I was like, "No, mm-hmm. I, this isn't the. This is not why I came down here, and obviously, I'm not supposed to get a tattoo." So I left, and then went back, and then it was my best friend's wedding, right? And we drove to Minnesota, to Minnesota, <laughs> and there was a lot the, of driving for the wedding. Then we drove back, and then I moved to Utah, and then I drove you to Utah. Then you drove me to Utah, and then we drove to LA. Yep, because I had. <laughs> oh, by the way. I had a storage unit. I'm like infamous at this storage place because I left LA and I left LA because, oh God, this is another story. Well, you lived in LA when you were 19. Yeah. I moved here around 19. For about 20, a year. Yeah. And then Left. I lived in the Valley, moved back to Minnesota, went to Rhode Island, realized I didn't want to do any of that, came back to LA. Right. Then I was like, I'm going to live in the nice. I'll figure somewhere else to live. Maybe not the valley because maybe that was the problem. It turns out it was. (laughs) You lived in Santa Monica. (laughs) And I loved my life and I created a really great life. However, I just so happened to have a neighbor. Okay, so here's what happened. One day I'm at a barbecue and my friend comes over from our little. It was totally classic Santa Monica little bungalows that they had from the you know 60s or 50s and there's a barbecue in a little courtyard and my friend's like hey uh, can i talk to you for a minute and he's like dagmar um our neighbor dagmar (laughs) (laughs) he's like ah she was saying some really weird stuff to me about you and i'm uh actually worried for your safety oh god (laughs) Yeah, I remember this story. I'm 21, guys, living in L.A. by myself. And I lived in this little studio, and my neighbor 
was like a paranoid schizophrenic. And she, there was something about Oliver Stone. She thought that I was working for Oliver Stone and that I was spying on her for Oliver Stone. I'm like, oh, by the way, Oliver Stone or anyone who knows Oliver Stone, I have a great movie for you to write. And here it is. <laughs> this freaking psychopath used to, she called my landlords and she would say, Bridget's leaving messages and her beer bottles that she's leaving outside her door for me like subliminal messages or something. And she, there was like a, a metal door out before the wood door mm -hmm. and she would be slamming on it at like six in the morning and telling me that she was going to kill me. And I had to call the police once and they came and they went, come to my door laughing and they're like, whoa, she got a piece of work over there. I was like, thanks guys. She's threatening to kill me all the time. Yeah, what can I do? Scary. And they said, I don't know, call your landlord. Like, you really can't get a restraining order. She lives like 600 feet away from you. And they told me that she said that I had come into her apartment and bugged it and I had left kisses on her walls. Like, I guess there was lipstick all over her walls. Which and she probably did in some sort of blackout. I don't know how it works. I'm not a crazy person. And then my landlords called me and they're like, well, do you work for Oliver Stone? And I was like, no, I don't fucking work. <laughs> For Oliver Stone, right? Like, Living in this shitty apartment. And I would love to shitty. meet Oliver Stone. So then I was in debt, mind you. This is pre fantasy. So we're going back to like, this is like 2001. Mm -hmm. Kid A. It was my, it was the Napster years. It was right. the glory days of the internet. I was working for buddyhead.com. I was inter interning. And some of you might be familiar with Buddy Head. It was the first sex column I wrote. I was the Buddy Head girl. I was the only girl. We had insane adventures. We went to Sundance. We went to South by Southwest when South by Southwest was cool. Like Travis and I drove overnight one night, 26 hours straight. You can do that when you're 21. Uh -huh. And just got there and went to our buddies who were performing and showed up right as they were getting on stage and then partied. And then we were partying with at the drive in on the way home in El Paso. I mean, my life's been nuts, guys. Nuts. This week, our sponsor is Folane. Folane is a clean beauty retailer with a curated selection of the highest performing, safest, and 100% non toxic products. Folane believes that you should never have to compromise your health for beauty. That's why every product on their shelves undergoes a rigorous five step approval process. Identify, research, test, validate, and launch. Folane's Clean Essentials Kit is the perfect way for anyone looking to explore clean beauty to get started. Also, it helps you majorly detox your daily routine. It's 100% non-toxic, vegan, and cruelty-free and suitable for all skin types. This kit is completely safe to use during pregnancy. The kit includes travel sizes of four everyday non-toxic skin essentials and our limited edition travel pouch. TSA approved products and perfect for holiday travel. A cleanser, toner, moisturizer, soap. I love my clean essential pouch. It's been a game changer for my skin. Before it felt a little dull and now it feels really rejuvenated. My skin feels amazing and brighter, smoother and more clear. And the products feel just so clean. Here's a special offer for listeners of Walk-In's Welcome for only $22. That's over 50% off. Try the Clean Essentials Kit today. Go to folane.com slash walk-in to try the kit and enter walk-in at checkout for free shipping. That's spelled folane, F-O-L-L-A-I-N, dot com slash walk-in and use promo code walk-in at checkout to get your Clean Essentials Kit for only $22 with free shipping. So you were living in LA, but then, so then you had to move back to Minnesota again, right? No, or, no you Rhode Island. Rhode Island. And so you put there were other family things going on and I went home but you uh, put to your help stuff out in storage. But I put my stuff in storage because my landlords weirdly couldn't do, do anything or weren't doing anything fast enough about my neighbor. And I was legitimately worried about my safety. And then I I was like, all right, I'm going to go home and work. I come from a resort town. So I was just figured for I'd go summer. home and work yep. for the summer, save money and come back to L.A. Yeah. That was in 2002. Or 10 years later, Bridget uh, makes it back to LA. It wasn't 10. It wasn't 10. It was, it was I like, moved in it 2007. Actually, yeah, so it, was, it was 2007. Yeah. So it was like six It was six, six but years. it felt like uh, it, it felt was longer. I call them the dark years. Because you got married in between. Well, my dad was like, don't get stuck in the trap, Bridget. Don't get stuck in the 
in the rut. And I'm like, I'm not going to get stuck in the rut, dad. And then, you and then I got stuck in the rut, yeah. the restaurant industry rut. And I convinced myself, this girl with all these massively huge dreams. By the way, I moved to LA to be an actress. That's what I wanted to do initially. I convinced myself that I was destined to be a waitress. Mm-hmm. And that was my... That was just it. And then I mar- I got married <laughs> two years later to a, a Belarusian. <laughs> a Belarusian busboy. <laughs> I still remember when you first saw him, where we were and what we were doing. <laughs> we were basically like not hoes, but like, well, it was like, it was my, like ho go- adjacent. my godmother had called me and was like, I have all these sailors in town. <laughs> It's ho adjacent. And was like, we're going out to dinner and we need some women. So will you get some women to come along? So we were at this dinner with like a bunch of sailors who were in town because the the town. They were pretty hot, but they were, you know, sailors. Sailors, whatever. So we're at this dinner. If you come from a sailing town, you know what sailors are like. And they were, there were a bunch of like good looking men at this dinner and Bridget's fascinated by the bus boy. (laughs) (laughs) I got fixated on him. She was like, that bus boy is so hot. He's so and hot. He, yeah. I was just like fixated on him. And my cousin, other cousin, not Maggie, was like, really, Bridge? <laughs> there are all these hot guys here with money and you're fascinated with the bus boy who doesn't speak English. Yep. And, and then, then I ended up marrying, marrying him. him. Yep. I went back like two nights later and picked him up. And yep. then, whoa, and then we had a, like a drunken one night stand. <laughs> And he woke up in the morning and he was like, oh, oh, I'm so oh, sick. I'm so sick. And I was like, oh, what a pussy. I thought you Russians could handle your liquor. And I was like, I'm out of here. Bye. And so I left. Didn't think I'd hear from him again, but wanted to hear from him. And I was like, that motherfucker never called me ever. After like a week. And then I go down to the place where he worked and they're like, Bridget, Bridget, did you hear about, did you hear about your Russian busboy? He had appendicitis that morning and I had to go (laughs) rush to the emergency room and I basically left him there dying, (laughs) like mocking him. He oh he still even we got married he used to give me hell for that like remember when you left me dying the first night we met <laughs> like I didn't know but okay but so you were in so you got stuck in the trap we're in our hometown for about six years and that's when uh, I mean we were attached to the hip yeah you, you moved in with me twice yeah <laughs> when you like had moved around and then um <laughs> i was a bit of a homeless vagabond after i left the marriage and then you went on tour and then you came back we went to <laughs> wedding and then i then i just de- i had decided to move because i finally finished school and you were like i, I gotta, like, get, out I gotta get out of this town where i'm related to everyone and so i decided to like i was basically like throwing darts on a map like i picked park city utah because it came up three times in one one week in conversation and i wanted to move to like a resort town, I wanted to move west. I was like, mountains would be cool. I'll go to Park City. And what the, oh, I remember. I was like, what the heck was I doing? But I was in like the hellish, most hell experience. Right. Yeah. So there was some family drama and yeah. it was insane and it was all consuming. And I also was like coming off the heels of a massively failed attempt at trying to do something with my business. The fed, the website still existed, but right. I was in financial over over my head and then Maggie left me behind from so Utah. We I moved to Utah, you moved me out there and then we drove to LA to yeah. clear out your storage unit. Because I'm like, "Oh, I have stuff and now I'm clearly not ever going back to LA." <laughs> Cause I'm an idiot. So we cleared out the storage unit. You, we drove back to Utah. You gave me a bunch of stuff to use for my new apartment, and new life. The shit hit the fan in my family. Then you flew home, and uh, within a month, you had moved to Utah <laughs> into my apartment with me. <laughs> yeah, that was a. I mean, that whole time in my life, holy crap. Yeah, that uh, was. A, you had like a house in Rhode Island yeah. and all of it. And then you, within I, a month, you had packed up and. Oh, less than a month. I had been, I had resettled back into the house after it had right. been emptied. Right. And then like. It's a bit of a family dust up. <laughs> <laughs> which I'm we don't need to go into about detail. This now. About, but. Uh, it was traumatic for everyone. <laughs> and then you called me and I was like, just come, come here. Yeah, yeah. Come to LA. I was in come dire straits. And that was idea was like go go to maggie that's true that's right 
And so Maggie then, and I had been like saving each other's ass for about a decade at that point. Right. And I was, I said, okay. And then my sister drove out to yeah. Utah with you. Yep. So then I drove across the country <laughs> again. <laughs> Jesus Christ. No wonder, you know, I was recent, not recently, a couple years ago, I was at a gas station and I was talking to my mom and I was like, Mom, she was talking about doing a road trip. I'm like, you don't want to take the Ford. That's the Walmart highway of the world. And these truckers were next to me in the gas station. And they were like, why do you sound like a truck driver? How do you know the highway is like a truck driver? But I have somewhere how many miles it was. Yep. Well, it was on the old Phetasy. On the baby car. But so you moved out to Utah. You stayed with me in my studio apartment for six months. I had three jobs. Mm -hmm. I worked at two restaurants and a ski lodge and i was living in this like <laughs> it was like a cross between a hotel and <laughs> apartments yeah. so like we had some people key. was we had a, like one of those sliding door keys for my key but it was like it had amenities it was nice it had a gym and uh, like a pool and a hot City. tub and we were right outside the town we were about 10 minutes outside it's so gorgeous we had fun in park city for rage yeah yeah i was there for rage. sundance we and then i sundance. met i was there for sundance and i met Lots of people because I did VIP at Harrios mm -hmm. and I, mm -hmm. you know, LA invades. And no matter what, I always say this chase your dreams or they'll chase you. And even leaving LA, I was always trying to get back. Even when I was married, I came, I came out to LA and I was trying to convince him to move there with me and he wasn't that into it really. And he didn't know what he'd do. And I just wanted to get back desperately. And then I met a really creative person and we ended up spending some Sundance together just palling around and he was like you're creative you belong in LA what are you doing mm -hmm. and I got offered a job in New York at the same time by these guys who came I mean you meet a lot of people right and you were working in the bars and the places where <laughs> yes as a of matter course. of fact I am Brazilian <laughs> <laughs> Everyone kept saying, are you Brazilian? Because there are so many Brazilians in Park <laughs> City. And I was saying, you could say that to any woman. It should be the pickup line for all men. Because if you say to anyone, are you Brazilian? Even if they're Asian, you're basically saying, you're are gorgeous. you the most gorgeous person in the world? Yeah. <laughs> like, and so the ongoing joke is, yes, as a matter of fact, I am Brazilian. Yeah. And we threw a fetacy party. Yep. We threw a fetacy party. We hadn't given up on the dream. And then you, in like in March, in the spring after the season was over, you moved to LA. And then, yep, and I had to get out. Okay, I was gone. Tell the story of your getting your apartment when you were moving back. Oh yeah, that's nuts too. And then, and I basically am the kind of person who, when I make up my mind to do something, it just happens almost like magic. Like I had sold everything in that house in Rhode Island in like a week. And then with Maggie, I I was falling into some bad habits too. And and Park City is very much like our hometown, just in the mountain. Yep. It's a resort town. It's the same <laughs> kind of. It, we weren't related to everyone, but it's the exact same town. Started feeling really small. And so then we ended up, I ended up like overnight moving to LA. Well, you would, you would talk to someone and you had, an it was apartment. like 48 hours. No, but you had an apartment lined up. Yeah. You were like ready to move in with someone or ready to move someone. I had a job and an apartment. And then I was right outside of Vegas on my way back to LA, but I made it happen. in like, it was like four days. Right. And I was on my way back to LA and the phone rings and it's the apartment and they're like, sorry, it fell through. And the job fell through too. I was right. like, oh no, this all happened on the drive. And immediately after I hung up with the people telling me that my apartment had fallen through, another block number called me and I'd never normally answer them, but I, it's something in me was like, answer that block to number. And I did. And it was my old landlord from when I had lived in LA in the little bungalows. Right. And, and I had called them a week before. And I totally forgot that I had called them. And he said a one bedroom had opened up and it was like 1200, which seems so insane now because one bedrooms in LA are like 1800. 2000. Yeah. And that wasn't even that long ago. And they just wanted to offer it to you before yeah. it went on the market because you had been a good tenant. And, and they probably they still felt, felt bad, bad <laughs> about, about the Dagmar the incident. Stone. Yeah. <laughs> And I was like, yeah, I'll take it. I don't even need to see it. And so then I ended up coming back and and that was that. And I've been here ever since. Right. So then 
after I had been in Park City for almost a year, it was slightly under a year. It was I stayed there through the summer. And then in September, I was like, I called you. I think I was crying. I was like, I don't know what to do now. I'm, I'm like, I, come to LA. You're like, come to LA. We'll figure it out. I was like, okay. So I packed up my car and I drove to LA. You were kind of like, I don't know. It's hot. I, I hate was like, the heat. Uh, LA, LA is not really my style. Yeah, it's not <laughs> Maggie's like, style at all, by the way. Yeah, Maggie uh, likes winter and quiet. Yeah, I, I like <laughs> the incessant sun in LA just drives me crazy. But it is an amazing place. I never thought I'd like it as much, but I don't think I would have liked it as much if I hadn't landed in Santa Monica. Well, then we lived together. Right. I stayed in your one bedroom for like a year and a half. We shared that apartment. We were so, so broke. So 2008 hit. I was teaching private yoga and hustling a million other jobs Mm -hmm. and working with autistic kids um, because that was what I was doing. But when I left L.A. when I was young, I got hooked into working with kids with autism by it was like an ad I'd seen somewhere they wanted creative people instead of trained like behavioral therapists. Mm -hmm. And I ended up being an aide to these kids with autism. And for some reason, it's just something that's always come naturally to me. And so I was doing that again. I was teaching theater to kids. I was teaching yoga all over the place. Mm -hmm. And when I first came to LA, I was working in a bar that didn't work out very well for like six months. I did it. And then I woke up one morning and I didn't remember how I got home and I was like I can't go back I've always been good at like pulling myself off the ledge even when I was using although I'm very lucky I should I should be dead right Um, but there were those moments of clarity where I'm like oh I gotta dial it back and quit this job because it's toxic so then I we were doing all kinds of odd jobs what were you doing I was First, I didn't. I didn't oh, want didn't to go back to waitressing. Well, I didn't want to go back to waitressing because I'd been doing it for so long, and I just finished in Utah, and I was like, "Oh God, I can't do waitressing." Were you, were you waitressing so, in Utah? Yeah. Oh yeah. And then I I became a personal assistant for a while. I was doing babysitting. I was yeah, nannying. But then finally, I was like, I'm not making enough money because we were so broke. So I went back to waitressing. 2008 hit and I'm the first thing to go. I'm disposable income. Mm-hmm. Even now, if that if that happened now, that would still be the case. Mm-hmm. And it was bad. My And mind you, I was still in debt from fantasy from driving around. Right. And those were adding up. Oh, and yeah. And you were missing payments. I was still like, married technically yeah. because I left... I was, I thought when I left, I was like, oh, I'm just going to get set. We thought we'd get separated and see how it went. And maybe he would come out or maybe I'd go home or whatever. And we stayed married because we were like, well, let's not get divorced right away. Mm-hmm. And maybe it will work out and we'll miss each other and whatever. And so I was still married. I was drowning in debt, drowning. Mm-hmm. And uh, we had all these bills. My car was about to get repoed. I was like two or three. I think it was three payments behind on it. And we were in this apartment. It was like basically empty. We had a. F- I was on a. Le- <laughs> I was on a blow up mattress in the bedroom, and you were on a yeah. futon in the living room. And the blow up mattress I was on started to leak. It was some dark time, and we couldn't afford a new blow up mattress. We, we couldn't. We afford couldn't afford shampoo. shampoo. We we got our shampoo at the dollar store, which I do not recommend. It was like horrible shampoo. <laughs> And we'd have like we call them the days of soup and toast. We'd have we had no soup we went and toast on, for dinner. Maggie and I did the master cleanse for two weeks Be- because we couldn't afford food, and we were like, "Oh, we'll just do the cleanse." Do the cleanse, and it was two weeks. It worked I out. Yeah, it was actually pretty good. But it's you, good to know you can go two weeks without food if you have enough molasses and lemons around and water. You were going on dates to get meals. Oh, yeah. I <laughs> you was, were on SugarDaddy.com. I was on SugarDaddy.com going on dates, bringing home leftovers for Maggie. <laughs> like, here's some filet for us. You were telling one of your dates, you were like, yeah, Maggie and I are about to sit down and have dinner. He was like, oh, what are you having? We were like, soup and toast. And he, that was how it got branded the days of soup and toast. He was like, that's not a meal. <laughs> He's like, what is this? The Great Depression. <laughs> but it really was for most of us who weren't in the 1%. Right. There was, those were very tough times. Massive amounts of wealth got wiped out of middle America and the rich just got richer. But well, that's another topic for another day. I was the one, remember how I was like, there's going to be a crash? Yep. And I predicted it yep. and I wrote a freaking blog because I was still writing on fantasy every it's all like these your stories. Online journal. Yeah. You were just writing. And I was like, oh, when the money men start freaking out because a lot of my clients were in finance and they started freaking out and tightening their belts and telling me like, oh, 
things aren't good. Mm -hmm. And I was like, when the money men start freaking out, like, you know, two months before the crash. Yeah. And there was a column I wrote. And then I put a picture of a guy jumping out of a window. (laughs) (laughs) It was like an ad. And Phetasy crashed. And that one column disappeared. (laughs) I'm sure it's a weird coincidence. But the whole website, I went to go to the website one day and it was empty. It's gone. Like the whole thing. Everything has been deleted. it. it. They restored it. Our guys restored it, but they couldn't restore that article. And that we could never find it anywhere. And I could never even find it on my hard drive. Mm-hmm. I still to this day can't find that article. So we have some conspiracy theories. <laughs> I don't know. It's so it is weird. That was a weird one. I was like, when the money men start freaking out, you better watch it. And then the market crashed mm-hmm. and I lost all my clients. It was the days of soup and toast. We couldn't we, afford a teapot yeah. because we that was our became our symbol of prosperity was getting finally being able to get a teapot. Which looking back was really dumb too because I wonder how much money we wasted just like even like a toaster oven. We used to burn toast and for the soup and toast we didn't even have a toaster oven. So we'd use the broiler. <laughs> and then we'd burn it. <laughs> and how much gas bill did I pay just making freaking toast? Oh, uh, yes. Wasn't exact. That was when too we went to the Costco, the Costco oh, trip. God. So for some reason, Bridget and I are idiots and decided we oh, called ourselves. And you can't say this anymore. I don't think so. Maggie's nodding her head, shaking her head, and like no, shaking. I'm gonna have head. to edit it out anyway. Our tards galore. <laughs> Maggie's more politically correct than I am, but you can't say this anymore, and I understand why. But back in 2007, mm-hmm. it was still a mildly acceptable term. Maybe not. Because we're from the East Coast. Where yes, it's still, where it's a term. Still thrown around pretty regularly. <laughs> loose, and fe- loose and furiously. And it's kind of a term of endearment. Yeah. So we would always joke about how we're just idiots and we wouldn't date anything. And like we made these really just basic mistakes and we still continue to. And so we went, we decided oh, what we really needed was to get Phetasy going again. And what we really needed to do in order to make that happen was we needed to spend more money, a ton of office supplies, because that was what was holding us back. <laughs> and I had like seven hundred dollars worth of credit on my credit Left. card. So we went to Costco. And I was like, you know what? Let a ride. Two shopping carts <laughs> worth of office supplies to get organized and organize the files and all of it and that set just to max out Bridget's credit card completely <laughs> <laughs> looking back and we go to check out and find out you can only use an Amex in if you want to use a credit card you can only use an how, Amex how have I lived this long I'm an idiot so we are like sitting there trying to figure because we know if you if Bridget applies for an Amex right now she's not getting one <laughs> Why didn't you apply? I think I, I, my was, I was badly in debt too. I, my credit was shot. And then we had to abandon two carts full of stuff in Costco. Oh my and God. And walk away. It was mortifying. Because we're idiots. But we're idiots. What were we doing? I don't know. Delusion. Maggie and I are delusional, by uh-huh. the way. Uh-huh. We've had a lot of delusions of grandeur over the years. And some of them have come true. Not all of them, but. You know, I, I and I do say this a lot. The difference between delusions and dreams is hard work and luck and and like, yeah, I think sometimes you you can have a an idea of what you where you want to go, but it might take 11 years to get there instead of 11 months. Right. Which we kind of thought was how it was going to be. Well, yeah. And so then we um somehow made it through the days of soup and toast. Yep. And then we stayed in that apartment for like a year and a half. And then the two bedroom apartment in our same building opened up. We slowly started upgrading. Right. And we moved into that. Things started getting better. Yep. I still don't really know what I was doing all those years. <laughs> it's a little unclear. <laughs> <laughs> I was hustling, teaching yeah. a lot of yoga. I, I was in amazing shape. You were waitressing at certain points. Yep. Yep. On and off waitressing yoga you were doing other things i don't i'm trying to remember what the hell you were doing kid, aid to kid it was that's the same right, that's right and then who fucking knows then one of the studio apartments <laughs> opened up in the building and i moved up there and you kept the two bedroom and then you started well because i realized i couldn't be a sugar baby 
that that's that was what happened right. during the days of soup and toast. Mm-hmm. Like I went on some dates. I was kind of like dipping my toe in the water. I'm like, can I do this? Because mm-hmm. I knew I know women in L.A. who do. And it looks amazing. Mm-hmm. They've got they've got apartments and cars and all kinds of shit. You just could never be at someone's beck and call. No. And I also really I can't dial it in. I can't like be attracted to somebody I'm not attracted to mm-hmm. and fake it. Yeah. I'm just I, I can't do it. I can't. Uh huh. I wish so, I could. I'd be so rich. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so then you went traveling again for like two years. You well, oh, I got my started, heart broken. That's right. You got your heart broken, and you started doing Couchsurfer dot com, and like had people come and stay with you. And now, and that's how you met Luna. Well, yeah. And then Luna's. You wanted to build up credit on your couch surfers. Luna is my friend who's currently staying with me right now. Right. And we've become like sisters from another mister and I've gone and stayed with her in London and she's come here and... And she and I watched Prince William's wedding like when she was here Luna's and Luna's like gone. family now. Yeah, she's You'll probably... Her, like, we'll probably do a podcast with Luna. Uh-huh. And then we ended up... Um, I Then I went up to work on a farm mm-hmm. that... It's another long story. We should save those for another day. But yeah. long story longer, we ended what led to so years go by. Basically, Phetasy's just like your online blog. Yeah, but it, I'm not really even on it anymore. Right. I mean, I'm, I can't even post on it because no, right because, because the it was so old. It was so old, and then my web designer moved to Puerto Rico. And you didn't have any money to like upgrade it or do anything. I you had, were like, I'm not putting any more money into Fetasy until I have a business plan. Yeah, and then I ended up going back to the farm last year, and it was on my birthday. I woke up and Phetasy would kind of pop in and out of existence. Sometimes we'd go and she'd be she'd there be up and then, and then sometimes, sometimes she'd, she'd be, be gone and yeah. then she'd pop back up and I was still paying for her to be hosted. So I at least wanted it. And then one day I went last year, a year ago, almost exactly. And she was gone, like completely gone. Not even on the back end, gone. It was like the server is gone. And I emailed my freaking Web, web designer who skipped the country and went to Puerto Rico. And he's like, oh, yeah, the server disbanded and moved to France. <laughs> I was like, what? Servers can do that? All My whole website's gone. Right. And there's nothing he could really do. Right. And so overnight, it was like all oh, things must ten die. Years, ten years. Ten of years of work, work. And writing is gone. Gone. And I had to like not have a nervous breakdown on this farm mm-hmm. because I it was... I had kind of gotten used to it with Phetasy popping in and out of existence. She scared you a lot over the years of She'd given me enough of a run. Yeah. She would run away a lot, uh-huh. but she always came back. <laughs> and this time she was permanently just gone. gone. It was kind of traumatic. Yeah. And I remember sitting by the fire, the wood fire up there, and just being like in shock, like somebody died. <laughs> and everyone was like, are you okay? I'm like, my website. Phetasy is Dedasy. Yeah. We always used to joke Phetasy isn't Dedasy, but that day Phetasy was Dedasy. Phetasy died. And I had started, I had Patreon at this point because I started that in London, which is another whole story when I like thought I lost my job at Playboy because my editor got fired and then I panicked and started a Patreon essentially. And um, I had a Patreon for like a year and a, a half. Mm-hmm. At that point, um, I don't even think, yeah, it was a year and a half. And so it so was- So Patreon kind of became- Phetasy. Phetasy after- And Patreon was what Phetasy was supposed to be, a subscriber service with, with different, different levels different and tiers. different things yep. that you can offer. And yep, now here we are. Yep. Sitting here telling you guys these stories of how- So I will re- Boot. Boot Phetasy someday. We are making plans to bring Phetasy back into the world. I loved her so much. I still miss being able to go there. And I'm, pro- you know, honestly, it's probably good that she's gone because I didn't have, it was hundreds. You know, they, it, Malcolm Gladwell has a whole idea. Is it Malcolm Gladwell? Is it got yep. the 10,000 yep. hours? That's when people ask me where I learned how to write. It was there. Mm -hmm. It was 10,000 hours of writing Mm -hmm. easily, easily of like hundreds Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of material of me just writing about life for years, for like a decade. Mm -hmm. That's where I wrote. And then overnight it all vanished. 
Clean slate. Clean slate. And probably good, though, because at this point, too, my Twitter was starting to get a little more active. And, you know, God. God I'm, only knows what was on the site at that oh, point. I'm so, I'm so grateful that it's gone now, actually. Mm-hmm. It kind of is. I'm sure as, as was my tattoo not happening, I'm sure Fetacy disappearing right when she did was a huge blessing in disguise that I don't really know what the purpose was for. Right. But that you trust in that kind of. I do. I trust in it. And it will be back. And, you know, as you can maybe tell from the story, I am like a dog with a freaking bone when it comes to chasing my dreams. And especially Fetacy because she's designed, I mean, in the spirit of a crop circle. Mm-hmm. But looks like a bullseye and for me and Maggie uh, we've always said all roads lead to fetacy so everything I do is really just in an attempt to get that brand back up and running right and and following through on all the stuff we always wanted to make greeting cards and t-shirts and we just want to make stuff shorts like yeah whatever sketches the only reason I'm doing any of this is because I just people are like, what drives you? I'm like, I just want to make stuff. Right. And we only we make stuff that makes us laugh. And that's it. <laughs> I just want to make stuff that kind of pokes, you know, makes like the make Brad Pitt great again hat. It's just something that's poking fun at a, Bunch a of symbol. Things, right. You know, I want to make I just want to be a little Fetacy was little always cheeky. trolling people in yeah. real life. Yeah. My first T-shirt said, are you that fucking cool? And yeah. I used to wear it in Williamsburg and make everybody angry. People would be so mad at that oh, T-shirt. God, but now it was, 10 year, it was 10 years before its time because now people would be like, where could I get that? Every time I wear it uh-huh. in Venice, everyone's like, where did you get that shirt? Yeah. So yeah, it's it's the time of fetish is now. This is the dawn <laughs> of the- <laughs> Yeah, there, you'll hear a lot more stories. But that's the that's the... That's the origin story of Fetacy. Start of this journey that we've been on now for a long time. Long time. Yep. Maggie was my first editor. And the first thing I ever really wrote that I was like, I'm going to write this is like an, a piece of erotica. Right. And you were like, wow, you're really good at this. And I was like, huh, <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> and now we're making podcasts together. So w- that's really all I want to do is like make stuff. It's, a, it's only the only goal has ever been to build something that I can make stuff with mm-hmm. and make people hopefully make some people laugh with it and, and inspire I'm, people. Yeah. And piss some people off along the way. Too, well, of uh, That's this just inevitable. era, Jesus. That's just inevitable. Someone's going to get mad at me saying our tard. <laughs> 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 the look on your face. <laughs> I mean, it's just such a great oh, and unfortunate geez. thing. Well, so that is, that's actually a good place to stop. We're about at an hour. Perfect. A good place to stop for the first story hour with Bridget. And as you can tell, Bridget's stories are crazy. There's, I can vouch for them all being true. And there's like a million more like this. Like this is only a, the very smallest sliver of what and her life all has the been. stories within this story that I can't, can't tell, tell right yet. Yes, and but this is like Maggie has permission to tell them when I'm dead. The though. smallest sliver of your stories. So and yours. We'll get to the. We'll get to those. <laughs> We'll get to those piece by piece. And I want to hear from you guys. If you have questions, let me know. Let us know. We want to hear, you know, if you're like, what? Blah, blah, blah. I can't promise that I'm going to answer them if it's something that I don't want to talk about. But I do. I do like send us questions. If you have questions about anything, whether it's any of my guests, whether it's life, whether it's any of my story, send me. I know a lot of people have been asking me who are you and what are you doing? So I thought it would be a good place to start with the origin of Fetacy and the name and the word and um, the brand and the brand. Yeah. Now go spread this. <laughs> spread spread it the word far and wide. <laughs> the word of Fetacy. I am the daughter of God. <laughs> <laughs> I start my cult today. And we're done here. <laughs> Just a reminder, our sponsor this week is Folane. For only $22, try the Clean Essentials kit today. Go to folane.com slash walkin to try the kit and enter walkin at checkout for free shipping. That's spelled F-O-L-L-A-I-N dot com slash 
WALKIN, W-A-L-K-I-N, and use promo code WALKIN at checkout to get your clean essentials kit for only $22 with free shipping. Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank Ricochet, our composer Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it's the dumbest line. <laughs>